Good morning. We're here with our new program, Conversation, with Dr. Charles Simmons. You are a man of great experience. You have been, you have uh, multiple lives to the service of the blacks in America, in the civil societies, and most of all in the higher education. But we will want to start uh, by introducing you to our viewers. And um, can you explain to us, uh, you are a Baltimorean, you were born here. How was Baltimore when you was a young guy? Thank you, and it's a pleasure seeing you, pleasure being with you. Um, I was born here in Baltimore, uh, Maryland, in 1938. Um, my parents came to Baltimore from Gainesville, Georgia in 1936, uh, following my grandmother who came here from Georgia as a domestic worker, she sent for my father and my mother. Um, 1938, uh, Baltimore, like all the rest of the United States, was thoroughly segregated. And so, um, and in, in the segregated, and Baltimore is still in the South, although segregation was in the North of the United States as well. And, and, in, and in the segregated uh, United States, Blacks lived in one community, whites lived in one community. Uh, blacks couldn't go into the stores owned by whites, and if we did, when we were able to go into stores like clothing stores, we couldn't try on the clothes, whether shoes or hats or anything. So black people had, um, we had our own economic base. Uh, we were forced to create our own businesses since we couldn't participate in white businesses. So we had an area in Baltimore called Pennsylvania Avenue that was, had a lot of black businesses in it. Then when um, the United, the government and the, the state government uh, also being segregated, created public housing for low income people. And you had to be below a certain income to qualify for this public projects, we called them, but it was public housing. Uh, the whites moved out of the community and they moved uh, even where they created public housing. There was public housing for whites, public housing for blacks. So we moved in uh, 1938 or 39, moved into what was called the Edgar Allan Poe public housing projects. Edgar Allan Poe was an author, a writer, author, right, white writer. And I grew up in public housing. Um, interestingly enough, even though you had to be below a certain income level to move in, to live, to, be, to qualify for public housing, my neighbors who lived across the street from me, who were not in public housing, lived in conditions worse than ours. In public housing, we had, we had good cement floors, we had steam heat, and we had indoor plumbing. I'm talking about 1938, 39, 40. My neighbors right across the street, some of my neighbors across the street from me still had outdoor um, outhouses and, um, and lived in, in worse conditions than we were, even though we were poor than them. Um, I went to school, uh, the schools were all segregated. Phyllis Wheatley Colored School, it was called, was my elementary school. Um, not far away. Um, uh, Booker T. Washington Junior High and Frederick Douglass High School. Interestingly enough though, in the projects where we lived, it was, it was like community. Um, the men in the project formed and you had to, if you had children, you had to be married. Um, and you, we had single seniors in the projects, but all of the, all the families with children had a husband, had a mother and a father, had to live there in order to qualify. So the men of the public housing projects would start men's club. And in the evening when they'd come home from work, they would meet and they would invite the young boys in to sit and participate. 
uh, the women started women's clubs. And so they would invite the young girls in to sit and participate. So at an early age, we were exposed to that kind of organizing and developing and addressing problems and issues facing your community, even as poor kids growing up because of the, of the um, environment there. Uh, between the courts where we lived, uh, you would have a building going this way, a building across, and a building coming this way. And in between all the courts were basketball courts so, and, and recreation facilities. Um, so even though it was for poor people, we, had, we were exposed to a lot of um, interaction and camaraderie. Uh, both with our peers as well as well as with the parents of our peers. And so that developed, I believe, that kind of early interaction and early attempts to think about and address societal problems at a young age imbues in, in, in children, even poor black children, the ideas and the concept and the practice of addressing and dealing with your own problems and dealing with situations that affect you as a community and as a people and as a family. So, so my experience of growing up in the project, I think was a very positive one. After high school, in fact, I, I left uh, high school in the 12th grade and went into the Marine Corps. And I spent four years in the Marine Corps. When did you start in the Marine Corps? Uh, 1955. Okay. In 1955, at 17 years of age, I went into the Marine Corps. I was my, um, at Paris Island. My basic training was at Paris Island and, and um, advanced uh, combat training at Camp Lejeune. I was then assigned to the Atomic Energy Commission um, where I went to aeronautics school at um, Jacksonville, Florida and Memphis, Tennessee. Um, and I spent the balance of my time, I was, we were in a helicopter unit uh, assigned to the Atomic Energy Commission where they experienced with the atomic bomb and the hydrogen bomb. And so what we would do as um, we, we, will, we, will, we will reach that stage. I want to come back a little bit about okay. these this men's clubs. Okay. Um, how was it organized? Can you give us a concrete example of how it was working? Well, for example, um, we would talk about um, work. Um, if someone was out of work or lost their job, the men would, would convene the meeting and they would invite the, the boys in to observe. Um, on occasion, I mean, we, had, we were free to participate if we had something to add, but for the most part, we were observers. And, and so they would address a range of issues in the community, whether it was jobs, um, um, whether it was um, economic development, how you could, one could start their own business if, if, if we would, for example, uh, if a person wanted to, had lost their job and wanted to start a business, these men would, would explore ways to help raise money to get started, find a location, things like that. Long ago, we would have sometimes issues with police um, brutality, and so the men would address that issue, what can we do, how can we contact the mayor or the governor or the regional police department to raise these kind of issues. So it was a range of, range of issues that affected our community that these men would, um, the men in our community, the fathers in our community would address. The women would do the same thing, um, issues of, of helping to you know, helping young girls to understand um, womanhood, you know, some of, the, some of the problems they faced 
maturing, growing up, female, female problems and things like that. So, so they addressed a range of issues that affected young people, both young boys and young girls. And so we were able to learn and, and primarily um, get the experience and exposure of people addressing the issues affecting their community that is not um, available in every impoverished community, whether it's black or white. Um, so, um, so in a way, it was very helpful um, uh, for us to grow up in that kind of environment. Uh, in a typical meeting, how many men were there and how many children around? I would think um, 10 to 15 men and 8 to 10 okay. children. You know, it was in a, an assembly hall. Yes. You know, there were uh, facilities designed, recreation facilities, meeting facilities, all built into the infrastructure of the uh, public housing. How often did you meet? Uh, once a week. Once a week. Men, yeah, a men would meet once a week. When did it end, it, the experience of this mess? Well, I... Um, and why? Um, now, we're talking about... Now, I was, again, beginning and we're talking about 1939. And um, I would say that that continued. I went into the Marine Corps in 1955. And I was still living in the public housing from 1939 to 1955. I would think that um, these clubs survived from 39 to 49 or 50, at least. And there were other activities. You know, we started, there were um, athletic clubs playing basketball, and we, we had basketball courts in between the uh, public housing units. Mm -hmm. And so we had organized basketball, kids playing basketball. Some of the um, older children in the community, both who lived in public housing and who, who are our neighbors right outside of public housing, started football teams called the Mystics. M-Y-S-T-I-C-X, T-I-C-S, Mystics, and they organized the young kids called the Junior Mystics. Mm -hmm. So we played, we had organized football in the community, uh, and I played football. Um, um, so it was, it was a lot of interaction with each other and with our peers and with our seniors that occurred during that time. Thank you. Now you are in the Marines, and I interrupted you. I, 1955, I, yes. I went into the Marine Corps, um, and I, my basic training was at Paris Island, South Carolina, and Camp Lejeune, advanced combat training, advanced uh, at Camp Lejeune in North Carolina, and then I was assigned to the uh, um, atomic, in the, I went into Marine Air, for Marine Air Command, and we were in a helicopter unit assigned to the Atomic Energy Commission. And our role, what happened was, the um, United States was experimenting with the atomic bomb. And so in, in um, Nevada, Yucca Flats, Nevada, and other areas right outside of Yucca Flats, Nevada, they would explode an atomic bomb either in the air or on, 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 on ground level or underground. And our response, and they, put, they would put these sensors out to test the radiation, the amount of radiation from these atomic bombs. And they would place the sensors and our responsibility after the blast, and they would have Marines and sailors and soldiers in foxholes and out in the public exposed to this 
radiation. And after the, expan after the explosion, we would have to go out and retrieve the, the, the sensors that would measure the level of radiation. But also, we, along with the, the soldiers and Marines who were in foxholes and out in the public, were exposed to the radiation. Mm -hmm. And they would, they, we would have to wear these badges that would measure the level of radiation exposure. So um, that was for the atomic bomb. Then uh, later, several years later, when the United States started experimenting with the hydrogen bomb in Anahuitoc, the Marshall Islands, um, we were, I was sent there, um, again with the Atomic Energy Commission. Again, they'd explode the bomb. We'd have to go out and retrieve the, the sensors that measured the level of radiation. Again, we wear these badges and Marines and soldiers and sailors were exposed to the level of radiation. And um, many, if not most of us, um, 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 develop um, cancer as, as an um, outcome of the exposure to the radiation. Uh, but that occurred, you know, down years later. We didn't know, I mean, the, the, those of us who, who were exposed to it didn't know. I'm sure that the people who were, who, who were in charge knew what was, you know, knew the effects of radiation on the human, on the human body. Um, but not only did, were sailors, soldiers, and Marines exposed to radiations when they started the testing of the hydrogen bomb, and they did the same thing for the atomic bomb. People in the immediate area, the residents in the immediate area, were moved out. And, and when they came back after all this testing, atomic and hydrogen testing occurred, the environment was contaminated. The water was contaminated, the food, everything that grew was contaminated. So these areas were, um, were unable to, you know, un uninhabitable um, later. Um, and even the people who came in years later to clean up the effects of the radiation were exposed to it and, and, um, and um, became ill uh, from cancer and other what they call um, presumptive diseases that the uh, federal government is now paying um, um, people who were who, who are exposed to some of these and who, who contracted many of these presumptive diseases. Cancer was just one of them. Um, there, but there were n several other diseases that the human body, that affects the human body from exposure to radiation. Yes, we are just here at the beginning of these experiments, either an atomic bomb in Nevada or in Marshall Island regarding the hydrogen. And you're going yourself, you're being exposed to all these radiations. How did it affect you then and uh, after your, after <coughs> your service in the years later? Well, as a young person then, um, I was not aware of the possible side effects of the radiation. And it didn't, um, I didn't start um, experiencing the physical aspect effects until later on. Um, but I, I ended up with um, esophageal cancer. Um, I was treated at the Cancer Treatment Centers of America for esophageal cancer. Um, um, and I guess cured. Um, so I was one of the lucky ones mm -hmm. because many of, most of us don't survive um, cancer. Uh, 
Yes, exposing people like this, was this a question of ignorance by your superiors? Did they know the danger you were going through? Or was it that you are, you are a soldier, you have to face the danger? I have to think that the superiors knew and the people who control, you know, knew. Um, um, the soldiers and the sailors who were exposed to it didn't know, but the superiors knew, I'm almost sure. And did you have any um, appraisal of whether they were sending more blacks or whites, or this was indifferent? When I was there, there were both blacks and whites there, and even in my um, company. Um, remember now, in the early days, in those days, the Marine Corps was the last branch of service that integrated. In, in the past, all of the services were, were segregated. There were blacks in the service, but they were in separate divisions, separate companies up until integration. But even after integration, um, in, in my platoon, in my division, there were more whites than blacks. So, in fact, when I went in 19, 55, my, my basic training platoon, there were only about five blacks in that platoon. Um, so, um, so I don't know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not aware that they were sending more blacks to be experimented on than whites, um, but I know they were both. When you discover this cancer, yourself. Was it easier for you to get the, uh, the Marine Corps uh, admitted that you, you had it while you were in service? It was easy. Um, by that time there were others who had, they had, I mean thousands of service people had already started complaining and getting benefits from these diseases, and so that the government set up a whole, whole list of de diseases that they call presumptive diseases, from exposure to radiation, to contaminated water. In Camp Lejeune, for example, the water was contaminated. There were, there were companies there that would put their waste in the regular water and the water was contaminated, so many of the Marines, if not most of the Marines, who were stationed at Camp Lejeune, and this, was, this went on for over 15 years, and I believe that they knew the water was contaminated. But later, when, when people started complaining and started suing and started bringing litigation against the government, they set up um, a system where they acknowledged that the exposure to contaminated water, the exposure to radiation, the exposure to other things created illnesses that they call presumptive diseases. So if you fall, fell in those categories of one of these presumptive diseases, you were almost automatically um, given benefits, disability benefits. And when did you end your service in the Marine? 1959, 1960. Um, I came back. I, I was stationed in California. My base, the, the, the helicopter base, was in Santa Ana, Santa Ana, California, right outside of Los Angeles. So when I was separated from the Marine Corps, I knew a lot of people who lived there. So I stayed there for a year or more. I uh, lived there, I started working there. My brother was also in the Marine Corps. He was stationed in El Toro, uh, California. He was a um, ordnance man and they um, created and uh, uh, um, attached ordnance to jets, you know, um, missiles and things like that. So he was about about three miles from me, 
And so he, he stayed in for 20 years. I got out after four years. And, but I stayed there and interacted with him and, and I had a child there. Um, my oldest son, um, Dominic, was born there. And so I, so I stayed there. Um, I didn't come back home until at, way after 1960. And I went, moved back and forth, went back and forth from Los Angeles to Baltimore. Um, so I came back here in late 1960, 1961, 1962, came back to Baltimore. Yes, uh, reflecting back as a young uh, Marines, young black Marines, what have you learned during your years in Marines for yourself on for the U.S. society at that time? Well, I would say that one of the benefits of military life and especially the Marine life is the development of the discipline, of discipline, self-discipline. Um, and I think that helped me in my later years that I could focus on something like the work I did with the developing the college and before that years ago with in the Teamsters Union and things like that. So, so I think one of the good things that come out of that is the, um, is the sense or the development of discipline. Um, because when you're in the, when the Marine Corps and in the service, that's what you do every day. You're training and you're studying and you're running and you're, you know, um, so everything is, is focused and discipline and timing and, you know, um, so that um, instills in one a sense of purpose, a sense of discipline. Um, also, uh, the school, I went to aeronautic school. Um, um, you know, the physical training is beneficial for, for you. Um, uh, the interaction with other people, people of other cultures, other cities, other states, other parts of the world, I traveled in different places when I was there. Um, so that exposure, um, but also um, there are many negative, the negative aspects of that as well, because again, it was segregated. Um, for example, um, when I was in boot camp, this is when you first go in, um, there are only about, as I said, about five or six or seven black guys, black men. And I'll give you an example. One day, um, one a young man, there were only two of us from Baltimore that were, were there, and his name was Robert Jones, and, and so we became friends. I'm a 17-year-old kid now. We became friends, and so one day we were um, standing talking to each other, and so were all the white um, recruits, you know, over there, white boys standing talking to each other, some over there, some over there. So the drill instructor, who's head of all, you know, of, of the boot camp of that platoon, came to us and said, break it up. Y'all remind me of the Goldust twins. Now, back in those days, there was um, a product. It was in a package. It was in a box. The box was gold. And on the, on the face of this box were black images with beady hair, big lips, um, um, big ears, big eyes, black um, on a gold box. And they called it the Gold Dust Twins. It was very humiliating, um, and America has a lot of that. I, you may know that even today, today since the demonstrations that's going on around the country, there was a there was a pancake mix called Anti Mama that has a black woman on it with a rag tied around her head, Aunt A U N T, but they call her Aunt G Mama. 
J-E-M-M-A-M-I or Jamama, M-A-M-A. Very negative, stereotypical image of a black person that this company, I think it's Procter & Gamble, is just right now, as we speak, talking about changing that package. But back in that day, there were a number of those products like that. And this uh, bacon, uh, it was bacon soda. This bacon soda called the Gold Dust Twins had this very negative image of black people with big lips and big eye, buck eyes and beady hair and you know. Um, and so he would come up to us and he felt comfortable come up to us and say, break it up. When all the white boys still stand around talking to each other and tell us to break it up because we reminded him of the Gold Dust Twins. In, in advanced training in Camp Lejeune, the drill instructor looked around. We were all sitting on the ground and a few blacks in the platoon. He looked around and he said to one of the blacks, what's your name? Yes, sir. My name is whatever his name was. He said, from now on, your name is Midnight. And then he looked around and he found one who was a little darker than him, and you were half past midnight. And so that was the, the, the sense, that was the environment back in 1955 that these people felt free and comfortable enough, you know, doing, treating us and talking to black people like that. I mean, that's what segregation was in the United States. When I, when I went to Jacksonville, Florida. Now Jacksonville is the, was the northernmost city of Florida, highly segregated. Um, we would go into town, the Marines on the weekend would go into town. We were in an advanced aeronautics school. We'd go into town into Jacksonville on the weekend and, and these gangs of white people would jump on if, you, if they caught you by yourself, you know, in a club or restaurant or in a bar, they'd beat you, jump on you. And so many, right. many, yeah, beat you with, with chains and tyrants and sent many, many black people to the hospital. We'd come, many black Marines would come back to the base in an ambulance to the hospital. And it went on and it went on until one day uh, we decided that we were going to have what we called the Dungaree Party. So the Marines got together, organized with black and white Marines, got together, put on our dungarees, our fatigues, and went in town and went into some of the areas where the Marines were, were, were beaten. Uh, beaten. And we'd, you know, uh, get revenge, seek revenge. Um, and that stopped, that's what stopped that beating of, of Marines on the weekend. And that's what it took to stop it when we would go back in and, and retaliate. Um, so in those days, the, 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 my experience was uh, both good and bad, um, and both positive and negative. Um, but it develops in you, you know, a sense of purpose, um, a sense of pride, um, and a sense of meaning that, you know, you, you have to do something for yourself and for your people. How did you react when this uh, superior came, pointed your figure to you, while other whites over there, and uh, this uh, uh, other black guy who was called Midnight and the other one after mm -hmm. Midnight. Mm -hmm. I think they were your superior and you are in the army, you have to obey, but did you have any reaction or did you have any possibility or did you just have to obey? Basically, there's nothing that you can do in a situation like that. So what it does, it, you hate it, you, you, you feel it, you, you're angry, um, but you have to decide whether you're going to um, learn how to 
take this and I mean and, and dress it and deal with it and internalize it, or are you gonna act out and and um, end up either incarcerated in jail, in the brig is what we called it in the in the service, or dishonorably discharged. Now there were there were individuals um, during my training um, who did act out and who were either in, in, in placed in jail or dishonorably discharged. But what it does, it, if you can manage to contain and that energy and that anger, um, you do so, but what it does it helps also develops in you a sense of purpose that this is something that I need to address and I need to fight and I need to change. And so in many ways, I think it contributed to my determination to be a change agent. Okay, thank you. One last question about your, your marine years. You thought that you had uh, aeronautical courses. I want to know what did you learn in in this regard. Aeronautical. Yes. Um. Just we were we were in a helicopter squadron, mm -hmm. and so the it helps you understand, you know, the discipline of of air of flight and yes. and mechanic helicopter mechanics. You know, yes. a lot of the things that you need to do to keep a helicopter in the air. Okay. You know. Here you are coming back to Baltimore. Did you notice any change in the city? How was the real reaction coming back home? When I came back, my um, parents were still living in the projects. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and it was still generally segregated. So we're talking about now, late 60s. Yes. You know, we had 1964, there was a civil rights decision and so, so we were pretty much doing the sixes. And even, even after civil rights decision, it didn't change anything right away. So, so it was still a lot of segregation, um, although things were beginning to open up. We could, for example, go into the, the, the main um, stores downtown, the, um, uh, but we couldn't try on, you know, we had to go to a certain section of the stores, even the basement, and we couldn't try on when, we, when they were allowed us to try on shoes or hats, we had to put on a stocking cap or a new set of socks or something like that. Um, so it was still a lot of segregation, um, but, but the black community business community was growing. We had our own black hospital, Provident Hospital, here in Baltimore. Uh, we had a number of black businesses up and down um, Pennsylvania Avenue and around, uh, around the city. Um, um, uh, but, but later, you know, it began to open up integration, some integration, um, but the problem with that is once, at least in my mind, and my experience, and my understanding of what happened, the negative aspects of integration was that once we were allowed, once the white stores opened and we were allowed to go to the white stores, we went to the white stores and as opposed to continuing to go to the black stores, and the black owned stores ended up going out of business because we started patronizing uh, the white stores. Um, and so that whole black community, that whole black business community that we had then is gone, gone. Uh, you mean that integration, so to speak, has somehow contributed to kill the black business? In my mind, that's what happened. We would walk past, not me, but, yes. uh -huh. but black folks would walk past. Now that we can go into the white store, we could go walk past the black store and patronize the white store. Now, the white store um, was bigger. 
had more, you know, products mm -hmm. because they had more money. They were, you yes. know, they, they controlled everything. Um, but we still, you know, the black movies went out of business. Eventually, Provident Hospital closed. Um, we had, around the country, from my understanding, had, over 50, had around 15 black hospitals in different cities throughout this nation. I don't know if we have any now. Provident was here in Baltimore. That's gone. Um, we had Park Sausage, which was a black um, sausage manufacturing company, huge black company, gone. Um, we had bars and restaurants, gone. Um, movie theaters, gone. Um, clothing stores, gone. Dr. Simmons, this is quite strange. This did not happen on one day. This is a progressive thing going on, and you see it happening. How did the black, uh, uh, the black community, how were they organized? Didn't they do anything to fight back? Um, there were groups that tried to organize, um, uh, but, you know, um, it's a strange thing. Um, the mentality of, of um, black people who had been so oppressed for so long, you know, finally when you lift a foot off of your head, you know, and you allow you to move around and, you know, you want to feel privileged and, 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 and go and participate in the, in the white stores that's it was hard to, um, to reverse that mentality during those days. Was there nobody to, to organize, to see the mistake in terms of business, the harm? There were groups we're that doing. organized, yeah. The NAACP, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Um, um, there were other, Urban League. There were other organizations that organized that tried to reverse this process uh, that are still in, around. NAACP is still here. Urban League is still here. There are other black organizations. Other black organizations evolved out of the community. The Black Panthers later on in life. It was difficult to reverse that, that, that move, that process. The Black Panthers, um, even later on, later in years, um, organized um, and uh, the, the Muslim organization, and they were successful. The Muslims, um, under, under the honorable Elijah Muhammad, they started their own businesses and they were very successful. Uh, they had a number of, of black businesses. Um, the Black Panthers organized. Um, um, they even organized um, and um, uh, started feeding programs in the community. There were other number of other groups that did that. They were feeding because we were still poor, and they were starting feeding programs and educational and training programs and sports um, and social organizations in the community. Um, the pa Black Panthers even went so far as later on in years of arming themselves as a protective force, a police force in the community. Um, but the white community responded by killing them off, you know, assassinating them, breaking into their house in the middle of the night, killing them, locking them up, forcing them. Um, that was before they passed this gun legislation that legalized the carrying of, of, un, gun, un, of guns. You see now, doing some of these demonstrations now, that some of these uh, um, right-wing white groups are going on with these automatic weapons, you know, and going out to these demonstrations and black demonstrations with these automatic weapons and, um, and it's fine, you know, the president called them very fine people. Um, but when blacks did that, they were assassinated and killed. Police killed them, you know, arrested them. Here you are in the Baltimore at the end of the 60s. What is your project? What are you looking for? 
Well, um, um, I became involved with the labor, labor movement. Um, and that was quite by accident. I worked at a big company called Montgomery Wards. I worked in the shipping and receiving department. I ended up making more money than the supervisor, white supervisor. And so he became um, a little angry and he asked, he wanted me to stop working overtime. And I said, well, I'm not working, I'm working in your department, I'm working in another department overtime. You don't have any control over that. So he fired me. And, and we were represented by the Teamsters Union. And so I went to the union to um, file a grievance against the company. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, and so being a, a black person, and I guess they the way I presented myself, and they hired me um, as a Teamsters Union representative and organizer. Because in, that, in those days, I remember now, we're just coming out of segregation, out of integration and segregation, out of segregation and integration, and the Teamsters wanted to recruit more uh, black people. Mm -hmm. And so there were all these companies that hired these black people, so they needed a black, um, um, organizer. So they hired me and I became a very successful uh, black union organizer. Um, and, 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 and because of the tenor of the, of the environment in those days, um, we still had civil rights movements going on. And you know, as I mentioned, we had the Black Panthers that emerged out of the community. We had a lot of civil rights activists and organizations like NAACP Urban League. In Baltimore, there was a gentleman called, named Walter P. Carter. Um, he was a black Jesuit. He was a member of the, of the Jesuit society. And, um, but he was an activist and he would bring a lot of these white ministers, white Jesuits, and help organize different communities, black communities. So, and they would put picket lines around these companies when, when, when he was trying to uh, get a movement going to organize around integration, integrating a particular venue. And so when I, when I needed help organizing some of these companies that had all these black workers that they were oppressing, I would ask Walter Carter to get some pickets, you know, some people to bring in and come put pickets around this company. Mm -hmm. And so he would. And so that would help me organize. I became a very effective organizer. And on the same, by, by, on the same token, when he wanted to organize a demonstration around a civil rights activity, mm -hmm. integrating a grocery store or a lunch counter, uh, which is what he did. Mm -hmm. um, he would get me to come, I was a good organizer, to come organize, so I would organize African Americans to come join him um, to help put pickets around to integrate um, different businesses or different, you know, um, activities, you know, mostly lunch counters. They were doing a lot of, in those days, a lot of demonstrations around lunch counters and a lot of, you know, um, the police would hose, the, bring the fire department and the hose police out and put these big heavy hoses to, they would knock you, you know, you out in the, on the picket line. These hoses were powerful enough to flip you. You could, you know, knock you on the ground. Um, but, you know, black people just continued to, to, to challenge that kind of violence and oppression and just continue. Uh, they would get beat, police would beat, you know, um, come up with horses and trucks and cars and run into people on the picket line and beat them, you know, and arrest them. And blacks just continued to fight and continued to demonstrate um, until they got what they, what they went after. 